Hello and welcome everyone to the Equity Master Investor Hour. I'm Sarit, Managing Editor at Equity Master. Uh, Rahul is unable to join us today, but we have a very, very special guest with us. Joining us once again on the Investor Hour is uh, our favorite trader, Vijay Bambani, once again. Vijay, uh, thanks a lot for joining us again on the Investor Hour. Thank you so much, Sarit. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure and privilege to talk to Equity Master subscribers. Great. Uh, Vijay, uh, this time we want to talk to you about multiple things. Uh, we've just had a, an extraordinary trading halt on the NSC just yesterday when we are recording this video. We also want to talk to you about a uh, lot of your uh, specialty trades, the trades that you're like super bullish on or bearish on also for that matter. And our viewers would like to know more about it, like gold, silver, and also your views on the Nifty and you know the best sectors to trade. And uh, basically, would like to cover a lot of ground with you on this video. So let's get started right away uh, to the most pressing topic. Uh, what exactly happened yesterday on the stock exchanges? Could you just uh, uh, let our viewers know? Many of them will be traders, even if they are not traders. Uh, it, was kind of confusing to many people. I'm sure a lot of people who were trading were badly affected as well. So uh, what are your views on this? Well, uh, Sarit, uh, uh, as of now, uh, we don't really have the complete picture of what happened. So the Securities and Exchange Board of India, SEBI, has uh, requested the NSE to uh, have an in, um, uh, in-house inquiry into what really went wrong. And um, I know as much as uh, the NSE and the SEBI have put up on their Twitter handles and on their websites, etc. You see, uh, when I was teaching uh, in, at the NISM or National Institute of Securities Market uh, Certification courses at the NSE Academy, yeah. there was a topic, uh, there, was a, there was a certification exam called Market Operations and Risk Management. Now, any NISM student having uh, uh, certified for this uh, uh, course will tell you that uh, the NSE is supposed to have two sets of servers, a mirror website and the main website, just in case the main website goes down due to any particular reason, technical glitch, cyber attack, or whatever. And then again, you have uh, uh, infrastructure in remote locations, Bangalore, Pune, New Delhi, et cetera, et cetera. And each location is backed up by two telecom providers, telecom service providers. All right. What we uh, uh, are told is that um, yesterday at uh, the Exchange Plaza in Mumbai, both the telecom networks went down, which is why trading was suspended after 11.40 a.m. Now, uh, mathematically speaking, uh, the probability of uh, both the telecom servers being knocked out of action because uh, uh, infrastructure at both ends failed and the remote locations, the mirror websites and all going down concurrently is, is very, very small. But it yeah. happened. Yeah. Do remember in the NASDAQ uh, a couple of decades ago, a squirrel bit into a power cable and brought trading to a halt. So stranger things have happened, and this was one of those bizarre incidents where uh, trading was halted uh, uh, due to reasons we'll only know later. But the fallout was extremely, extremely harsh on traders, especially those who resort to what we professional traders call stacking. Stacking is when you, when you build a layer upon layer of uh, positions, both long and short, on an intraday basis because your broker allows you to create that kind of super leverage. I'm not talking of leverage, I'm talking of super leverage. This, is, this would be leverage which your broker provides which over and above what the exchange provides? Yes, yes. So, uh, for example, uh, it costs you approximately 1,50,000 rupees to trade one lot of the Nifty. Yeah. Now, uh, various brokers allow you a 2x, 3x, up to 4x of that leverage. So which effectively means that uh, if a broker is offering me 4x leverage, as compared to another who is not providing that intraday leverage, the broker not providing that intraday leverage will allow me to build only one uh, 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 lot of the Nifty. 
but a guy allowing me for x leverage will allow me to build three stacks of nifty on top of the first one so i'll have four lots nifty positions right the condition being that the trader will square up his super leverage positions at least 15 minutes before the market closes number 1 or the money that he has given the insufficient money that he has given is eroded by mark to market losses to the extent of 70% or higher and the positions will be extinguished by the broker's back office risk management software okay okay so yesterday when the nse's uh, servers went down brokers uh, back offices went into a tizzy do remember that we have many precedents uh, uh, where a lot of uh, 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 clients lost money because of uh, very bizarre uh, events for example the uh, 2012 fat finger trade uh, uh, with a mumbai based broker yeah i remember that episode yeah right so uh, brokers uh, are not wanting to uh, risk uh, any losses or potential default or payment crisis from clients who would uh, basically resort to force majeure used the inter exchange interoperability to knock out positions of clients now let me explain to you what it really means in the good old days or bad old days depending on which way you look at it you could buy from one exchange and sell only on that exchange yeah yeah and arbitrage happened if the difference in price between two exchanges was substantial which in some cases it used to be so people with a lot of ready delivery of stock would buy from an exchange where the stock was available cheaper and sell it on the exchange where stock was putting higher this was called arbitrage now that has been driven out because you could buy on the bse and sell on the nse and vice versa so what the brokers did yesterday was if a client had positions on the nse he was leveraged or super leveraged both in cash and in fno to cover their risk or potential losses they cleaned out the client's positions on the bse using interoperability so this happened only for those uh, super leverage trades or did this happen for regular fno trades as well uh this would happen depending on at the discretion of the broker but my guess is that a lot of brokers like i said uh, sarit it's early days yet we don't have the exact uh, complete fallout of what has happened for example in the fat finger trade we know the exact uh, quantum of the loss but of course that was 2012 right now we haven't even uh, gotten around to computing how much of investor slash traders money was lost in the glitch so we'll not know how many brokers back offices uh, cleaned out how many clients is uh, trades but the guys who were short i can tell you that were taken to the cleaners and then the situation was escalated to a degree uh by the nse uh, uh, resuming trading uh, uh, in the extended session which lasted up to 5 pm when trading resumed uh, the pending orders were basically cancelled so which means if a if a client was leveraged or super leveraged both in the cash or fno and had shorted and kept a stop loss trading order those orders were cancelled which means you were now naked short the bulls realized what was happening and they started buying remember in the last uh, uh, 10 months or so it is the bulls who have made more money as compared to the bears so they have a lot of fire power yeah they have a lot of money muscle power so they are the dominant force in the market right now so when they started resorting to buying the guys who had gone short and been uh, knocked out of action by the glitch had and and they had to square up uh, 15 minutes before the session was to end remember that yeah these right. these are super leverage trades if you don't square up the computer will right so there was a mad flurry to square up all short positions which is why the market simply zoomed up uh in the past instances whenever uh, such uh, glitches have occurred you will realize that uh, there had been panic there was worry people actually uh, sold their shares out of fear out of nervousness uh, 
so I was really surprised as to why the market actually shot up after the trading resumed uh, on the NSE. Now we know that uh, uh, all pending orders were cancelled, including the stop losses, etc. And shorts got uh, completely squeezed out uh, uh, on an intraday basis, which is why the markets jumped. That's a truly extraordinary event that happened, and it's it's a good thing that you could you know clarify for our viewers exactly what transpired. Uh, I think a lot of people, including me, we were quite surprised why the market jumped so much. So I mean, I, yesterday we did not know, but of course today we do. Uh, I think uh, you've uh, made a video on this topic, if I'm not wrong, Vijay. Yes, I have, Sarit. Uh, I think uh, we should be releasing that tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, I've already uploaded that video and I've explained in great detail as to what really happened and why, instead of falling after this glitch, the markets actually rose. So, uh, to be very honest with you, Sarit, I was as surprised as you were when the markets resumed trading and markets shot up. All right. So, uh, since we're recording this on Thursday, 25th February, and we'll uh, put this uh, Investor Hour episode on YouTube and on our website on Friday, 26th, Vijay's video will already be available by then. I will put a link to it below. If you haven't watched it, viewers, uh, please click on it and watch it right away. I'm sure you'd love to know exactly what happened on Wednesday. So, uh, Vijay, thanks for that explanation. Uh, I just wanted to get this uh, topic out of the way immediately because that's the hot topic of the day and everyone wanted to know exactly what happened. But of course, we need to cover a lot more ground with you. Uh, what uh, is your view on the market right now? How does the Nifty look? Does that big jump on uh, that we saw on Wednesday change everything? The trend was down. Has it reversed? Will, will the market go up now? Sarit, uh, in the last investor hour that I uh, recorded with you, I uh, let me pick up the threads from where I left off there, if you permit. Yeah, sure, sure. So I said uh, uh, I would be a little more clear about what's happening once uh, the calendar year is over. I would like to see how Diwali is done and over with, what kind of festive buying comes in, and uh, markets would have digested the quarterly and half yearly results, etc. Now, frankly, uh, uh, at that point in time, in, in that investor hour, I was expecting the markets to come down after December. I believe you said it'll, uh, you were expecting it to fall in sometime in January. Yes, yes. I was expecting a fall in January. It did start falling pre-budget, but then, of course, the budget completely changed everything. That's right. That's right. Now... What has transpired between the last investor hour that I did, uh, I think it was four to six months ago, maybe. I'm not yeah. able to get the exact date. True. So what has transpired between then and now is the huge amount of unbacked currency that is being flooded into the markets. Now, this is a factor that is driving prices higher. There's a lot of liquidity dashing around. And that is why old timers like me uh, uh, were initially taken by surprise. We even treated the rally with a certain amount of skepticism, with a great deal of skepticism in my case. In the month of April and May, when I saw in 2020, when I saw the markets going up, I said, no way this is happening because I look around me, I go down for a walk, all the shops are closed. Yeah. Industry is closed. And, and, and there's nobody out on the road. So no way the stock market is going up. But then, uh, you see, uh, 2008 uh, global financial crisis had taught the central bankers that the best thing you can do uh, to push markets up is simply flood the markets with money. Yeah, they have definitely learned that lesson like, and taken it to heart. Yeah. Yes, not only taken it to heart, but this time around, uh, the flooding of money is infinitely bigger as compared to 2008. And uh, the taper tantrum or the withdrawal of the stimulus in many parts of the world has not yet stopped after 2008. And this has now come as, a, as an icing on the cake. Yeah. So uh, this is one change that the money is flooding the system. And corrections, if any, are likely to be fairly brief. They will be uh, uh, maybe vicious where price is concerned. But I don't think they're going to take uh, a whole lot of time to uh, terminate. 
you could you could basically have a very sharp two and three percent decline for three four five days and suddenly on the sixth day it's back to normal as if nothing really happened and that is exactly what happened right i mean the market fell for i think five days in a row and suddenly we yesterday you know, it just seemed like everything was back to normal again true true so uh, um, i use a lot of statistical uh, uh, models for uh, trading sarit and uh, my in house statistical model we programmed uh, something called the impetus impetus is velocity or momentum of uh, the prices okay now recording a video uh, uh, last weekend i saw that uh, even though the markets uh, had fallen the downward impetus was actually slowing now that came as a surprise to me now making a thumbnail for the video i didn't know what to do would i would i say that the market is going to fall or would i say that the markets are down but not out the data said the markets were down but not out so what is really happening is like you rightly said 3 4 5 days is how long a downward trend is lasting i don't know whether we can even call it a trend you can you can basically yeah. call it a, a small event yeah that's true and uh, it's back to normal people are so complacent about uh, thinking that uh, the only way to make money is buy at 9:15 and exit at 3:30 if you do not make money on the same day wait for the next day you're going to be 90% or 95% probability is you're going to be out with profits and uh, uh, to their good fortune it's actually working out for them so right now the only trade that seems to prevail in the market is a long side trade nobody is even uh, uh, thinking about short selling yeah and short selling are getting short sellers are getting good yeah and the guys who were brave enough to go short they got clobbered yesterday so uh, they they'll take a while before they have the nerves to get back in and short the market again oh yes oh yes yeah. okay so vijay uh, now that the market has started rising again as you said uh, what if it keeps going up uh, what would be the right way to play it if you're a trader i mean do you go long on the nifty or do, would you uh, recommend focusing on specific sectors and if so what are the best sectors and themes that are looking good right now well uh, sarit uh, i don't know whether uh, this answer is going to be appropriate for most of our viewers uh, i would talk about myself only and uh, you can viewers can feel free to disagree sure sure my conviction levels of going all out on the long side like a blanket buy yeah is extremely poor okay so i'm simply not comfortable buying if at all i would buy i would buy as a day trader alone not only as a day trader but as a micro trend trader a micro trend trader is somebody who keeps a trade open for 59 minutes and 59 seconds well that's and, that's a very short period of time yeah exactly so which is why uh, we uh, professional traders resort to stacking right the stacking is multi layering of your leverage super leverage yeah so uh, uh, when you when you are waiting for 25 30 or 50 paise price move you basically instead of buying 500 shares you will buy 5000 10000 20000 shares wait for the price to go up by 20 30 paise which is very possible in 59 minutes and 59 seconds and you're out So this is an extremely short term trade extremely short so if i was to go long i would go long only in this manner okay okay and uh, uh, if i was to buy now we are talking about investing yeah. if i was to buy i would buy those stocks which fall into the tina category there is no alternative now which stocks uh, are these now they would be fmcg so companies making toothpaste toothbrushes okay uh, shoe polishes okay. mineral water food okay. bread cheese clothes now a lot of things might change post covid people could uh, basically resort to public uh, private transport more than public transport or what not but you're going to wear clothes you're going to consume food you're going to buy uh, uh, personal care products so these are tina factor what you would call the uh, non discretionary uh, consumption items things that you cannot do without right right 
So I, I think there is a certain amount of predictability here with a sort of fairly uh, uh, steady rising population. The demand for these products is unlikely to fade away. So if at all the markets were to come down, I don't mind buying FMCG. Not at these levels, though. Okay. And uh, uh, if pharma stocks were to uh, uh, correct significantly, which I think they will, because right now there is this expectation that any and everybody making medicines will go up uh, because of the COVID vaccine. Everybody is not making vaccine. Yeah, that's true. that's true. Right. So at some point in time, pharma stocks will correct. I don't mind buying a little bit of pharma. And uh, 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 I think inflation is going to jump to the moon with uh, so much of easy and uh, cheap money being uh, unbacked currency, I would rather add, being printed and flooded into the system. You're suddenly seeing uh, interest rates uh, uh, being pressurized, so which is a nightmare for a fixed income uh, uh, investor. So your inflation is rising on one hand, and your yields from fixed deposits or other debt instruments are falling, which is why they are uh, being forced into equity uh, uh, to mitigate uh, those falling uh, returns from fixed income, which is why equities are rising in the first place. Also. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, I would wait for uh, inflation to peak out, and I would suggest uh, uh, bond funds. You would suggest bond funds, even though interest are going, interest rates are going to go up, no? Uh, Sarit, uh, at some point in time, interest rates uh, will also peak out. I don't see double-digit yields coming to Indian uh, a 10-year benchmark bond yields. Sure enough, in the last one fortnight, we we fortnight ago we were between 5.9, 5.95% uh, yield on the 10-year benchmark paper. Yeah. We are now comfortably settling at uh, 6.20. Now that's become the norm. Okay. Okay. Right. So do I think uh, this is a repeat of 2013 when we suddenly went very close to 8.8, 8.9? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. But at that point in time, uh, uh, once the interest rates peak out and, and, uh, uh, the current uh, batch of 10-year benchmark bonds have been hammered down. I think uh, you can selectively buy into bond funds because then bond prices will start rising again. And not only will you get uh, the NAV uh, benefit from interest rates, but also from capital appreciation from bond prices. Right. So uh, bond funds are not a buy right now, but uh, once you see inflation topping out, which could happen sometime this year. You think it will be a good idea to get into bond funds selectively? Selectively, yes, of course. And of and, course, uh, yeah, please go on, sir. Yeah, basically, I just wanted to put out a, a cautionary note that you know bond funds have taken a bad hit recently over the last few years. It's always very important to check the asset quality of each bond. You know, uh, make sure they all investing in either government securities or uh, GSEX, AAA, uh, corporate de deposits. You know, if they have too, mu too much of uh, long-term AA and you know, AA plus or B rated securities, uh, that is a warning sign. We all know what happened to Franklin Templeton. So uh, that's a cautionary note. Just wanted to put it out there so that our viewers you know, stay extra cautious. Yeah, go on, Vijay. You were talking more about inflation. Yeah, so I was actually coming towards the quality of uh, the bond funds. I, I prefer sovereign guarantee funds. Okay. Sovereign guaranteed investments, sovereign guaranteed bonds. Now, uh, um, like I uh, referenced the NISM uh, uh, textbooks, I, I, I've also taught uh, about uh, mutual funds as, as a guest lecturer there. So I had the advantage of uh, learning on the fly myself. I realized that sovereign guarantee does not uh, mean only central government, but even state governments are treated as sovereign guaranteed funds. Now, increasingly, as the government uh, uh, runs out of money or, or feels uh, a liquidity crunch, for the want of a better word, you're going to have municipalities coming out with bonds. 
right even though it could be the brihan mumbai mahanagar palika bond a municipal bond it would still be treated as a sovereign guaranteed uh, uh, investment although state government guarantee so i would prefer sovereign guarantee especially primarily of the central government for a simple reason you see franklin templeton was a private party yeah that's right when their bond investments or their schemes took a hit because it wasn't just bond investments the money was also into non uh, uh, approved uh, investments now if the, if i invest money in a sovereign bond how does the government pay me even though something goes wrong the government has the power to print money which private parties do not even state governments do not have yeah even state governments do not which is why i said i prefer central government central government second so the government will run the uh, printing press overnight print currency and pay back the bond holders sure enough that money will have limited buying power because inflation will go up but what would i rather have would i have all my money going down the tubes in franklin templeton or would i have money given to the government the government print some currency unbacked currency gives me back that currency which is uh, uh, eroding buying power by say 8 10 12% i still get back 18 85 90 95% percent of my money back i want my money back it's as simple as that that's true yeah. it's a very tricky thing to do right now which is and uh, so many people are concerned about inflation but at the same time they want to jump into uh, safe securities and interest rates are so low uh, it's like a kind of a double whammy they are especially uh, senior citizens uh, you know they have so much money in the bank right now uh, they get nothing out of it and if you tell them the inflation is going to go up they are just going to feel like even more of a need to you know take money out of stocks and stuff it even to even into fds even more exactly exactly sir and and the reverse could also be true you could succumb to temptation because everybody is having a party Yeah. and take money out of your debt funds or uh, fixed deposits and uh, uh, blindly put it into equity funds or direct into equities yourself now which is extremely counterproductive which is extremely scary because i i use a statistical tool called the jensen's measure now this is something that uh, every hedge fund manager worth his uh, uh, salt uh, uses it basically uh, measures uh the the risk reward ratio or the payoff ratio of taking on one additional unit of risk if you take one additional unit of risk which is fine which which is what you are there for as a hedge fund you you are there to take risk but does it actually return two units of reward if it does not that risk should not be undertaken so as far as i am concerned the risk reward ratio based on the jensen's measure has turned hostile many weeks ago so which is why i said i'm not comfortable buying i'm a statistician i use statistical models my models don't allow me to buy if i buy i will buy for 59 minutes and 59 seconds then i'm done with profit or loss my trade is closed on the 60th minute so getting your money out of fixed income investments into equities at this point in time especially if you're going to live off on the money the jensen's measure doesn't allow you to do that so you you basically are throwing caution to the winds and which is when uh, you're responsible for your actions yeah this is something even our editors at equity master you know rahul tanushree they all say the same thing as in markets have gone up so much even if you look at uh, valuation measures on a fundamental basis like pe ratio price to book uh, these large cap stocks which everyone is buying right now and index heavyweights they've gone up so much that there's almost no margin of safety in the matter so uh, any negative trigger i could see a huge flood of money just rushing out like we saw over the last one week and that would cause a lot of problems for anyone who's recently come in the market so is maybe broken an fd and you know taken that money and bought it in you know it's very very risky you know, you're absolutely right about that. i uh, just uh, continue on this topic of uh, inflation i mean right now it's the big hot topic right now with petrol about 100 and god knows what not 
uh, food prices. I, I believe uh, I saw one link that you sent to me on on uh, on social media. I believe or on Teams, uh, which said that uh, milk prices are going to go up or something like that. So, I mean, it's 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 tough times, uh, you know, for the especially for the poorer sections of society. Uh, which is why that probably explains the reason why the people who do have money are taking funds out of you know, fixed deposits and cash and moving into stocks. At least they're going to get some uh, profits out of it. Uh, but to stay on this topic, uh, is there some way that uh, you know traders could profit from inflation? As in, could they go long on, let's say, crude oil, for example? I know you made a video which said, "Don't do that at all." Or don't go along on crude oil. So, wh- why did you give that call? Sarit, um, uh, in 2019, I had come to your studio and uh, recorded uh, uh, these uh, FPD videos uh, in your office. And Saudi Aramco's uh, IPO was done and dusted. The initial, uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, had targeted an initial uh, ballpark figure of $200 billion for this IPO. He wanted the Aramco IPO to be $200 billion and not lower. But ultimately, he wound up taking $25 billion only because that is just how much the market was willing to give him. The fact that he took it, the fact that the Saudis took it, told you that they needed money. And... All through the run-up to the IPO, I kept on recording videos saying that crude is going to go up. And I also said very openly, the only reason why I think crude is going to go up is because the Saudis, of course, helped by other OPEC and non-OPEC oil exporters, because they all had a vested interest together, want to push the price of crude higher. If you're coming out with an IPO of an oil uh, uh, drilling, gas drilling and oil refining company, the probability of succeeding in your IPO is significantly higher if your if your product is appreciating in value, which is why the Saudis wanted to push oil prices higher. Now, after the IPO, I distinctly remember recording a video saying that the Saudis have not got as much money as they wanted from the IPO. And this money is not even enough to pay back the bonds that are due for redemption in the next 18 months which means either the Aramco guys or the government of Saudi Arabia, in in this case, sovereign borrowing, comes out A, with a bond fund, or Aramco comes out with a follow-on public offer. Guess what? We are seeing it right now, yeah. Guess what? The Saudi government has floated euro-denominated bonds. This is sovereign debt. And Aramco has uh, uh, floated the idea of a follow-on public offer. Got that now, here, absolutely right. Yeah. Yes. So here you are. Oil prices will need to be pushed up again if the Saudi Aramco IPO is to succeed. And this time, uh, the challenge is far higher. This is a post-COVID world. And uh, to make the Aramco IPO successful, oil prices might need to be pushed even more aggressively. So uh, a, a bubble, if you... I, I'm contrarian. I know a lot of people are talking about a bull market in oil. I think the world is awash with oil. The only reason, uh, the only thing uh, that's uh, uh, causing oil prices to go up is artificial choking off of uh, output by producers and creating an artificial shortage. Once the IPO is done, they're going to let the price fall, which is then, I fear, going to drop like a rock. That is something that very few people are talking about right now, which is- Everyone seems to be in a crowded trade of pushing crude oil higher, and that's causing a lot of trouble for oil importing countries like India. Uh, but you're on the opposite side. You're saying that you know once the IPO is done and the FPO is done and dusted, it's going to crude is going to fall like a rock, and that will hopefully for India's sake it will help to ease our inflation. Uh, but uh, uh, when do you expect this to happen, Vijay? What could be the probable timing for the FPO? I think, uh, uh, Sarit, um, the rule of 100 comes into play here. For the kind of size of the IPO that uh, MBS, or Mohammed bin Salman, uh, as he's popularly known, abbreviated as MBS, he would want the money as fast as possible. He has this dream project called Vision 2030. 
he wants to make uh, an artificial man made city in the northeastern desert in saudi arabia climate controlled tourist attraction something like uh, a gigantic uh, uh, walt disney uh, uh, replica in uh, saudi arabia so if you if you ask him when does he want the ipo i think he would say tomorrow morning but uh, appointing uh, international uh, uh, lead managers and uh, conducting road shows etc takes a minimum of 100 days if not longer and that too if the market is conducive to writing out big ticket checks so i think uh, it's going to be many many months the oil bubble will keep getting inflated and if you allow me to go off topic here everybody was talking about a crowded trade in uh, natural gas as uh, uh, recently as a fortnight ago uh, spot prices of natural gas shot up to 500 dollars uh, 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 mm btu wow that's whereas in, that's crazy yeah whereas in the in the forward market it was 3 dollars so here is 3 dollars here is 500 dollars and everybody was telling me you're crazy recommending shorts to weekly cash alert uh, uh, subscribers because you're going to get cleaned out if you check your terminal prices now we are in a, a downward spiral uh, since the last five trading sessions we've seen at least three trading sessions hitting lower circuits on natural gas what really happened is that uh, uh, the weather warmed up and as you approach the vernal equinox which is the onset official onset of summer you're going to see a, a crowded exit from a trade which was uh, 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 ballooning up because of a crowded entry so exactly the same thing will be repeated in crude oil how fast will the ipo be launched i wish i had a handle on that i would get i would i would want it to come and get uh, 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 done and over with as fast as possible so i can recommend even more trades yeah. for my weekly gas even more short selling yeah yeah yes 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 why not why not we are here to make money yeah absolutely absolutely and uh, i have to congratulate you on that natural gas call that was absolutely terrific i know you uh, copped a lot of uh, fair amount of criticism from a lot of our subscribers as well as in you know, when initially when the prices jumped up like you said but of course right now we are as you said we are in a downward spiral Uh, as the temperatures keep warming up in you know, across europe and us demand for natural gas will keep falling as you correctly predicted and that should act like a huge dampener on the prices so congratulations on that, that thank call you. thank you thank you thank uh, you on this topic of inflation uh, uh, what about gold i mean isn't that the most logical thing you know that should counter inflation but we have seen gold prices falling and you have been a big bull on gold so we uh, whenever you uh, put up videos on youtube i always see you know some comment or the other if not every every on every video at least on the, every second video you know what's happening to gold are you still bullish on gold so what would be your view right now sir it uh, i'm an old man you can see the gray yeah. hair on my head <laughs> you are not that old <laughs> <laughs> i don't really a form views all that fast and once the view is formed change views all that fast so when i uh, recommended a buy uh, to weekly cash alert subscribers in physical gold and silver of course in june of 2019 uh this is the first time i'm putting a a, a time frame to it yeah heart of hearts very frankly i was thinking in multiples of a minimum a minimum of half a decade Five years. Okay. If not long, it could span up to eight years. Now, if you tell a subscriber that I want you to buy this and hold this for five years, he might just throw a shoe at you. Yeah. I mean, very few people have that level of patience. Very few. Yes, they do. But then look at what's happened. We entered silver at under thirty-six thousand. We are now at seventy thousand. If you think elephants don't dance, take a look at what silver did. And mind you, it's come down from seventy-seven thousand to seventy thousand now. So silver doubled in approximately a year after we purchased it. 
so will gold also go up yes i think so this is the beginning of inflation there are some uh, 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 very wizened and uh, uh, veteran investors slash traders and hedge fund managers who stick their neck out and say we are expecting hyper inflation yes i remember michael bari had you know, made such a call of hyper inflation yes you cannot keep uh, uh, printing unbacked currency and you cannot have now take take a look at the reflation in base metals the most amazing thing is uh, uh, a laggard of a base metal called aluminum going from 125 to 175 copper which of course is uh, industrially uh, actively used has risen from 575 odd to 700 plus so these are industrial products which are inflating by leaps and bounds so your wpi inflation is going to go up i monitor fruits and vegetable prices from the veggie market since many many years on a weekly basis and after covid prices of many fruits vegetables grains poultry meats and uh, 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 spices etc have inflated you cannot have runaway inflation and have gold prices which are going to be subdued artificially for too long the other factor that has acted as a deterrent to a price a rise in gold is bitcoin or for that matter other cryptocurrencies now are these cryptocurrencies an investment i don't think so they are trades they are not investments they are trades yeah. will they become currency maybe they will but i i will not believe it till i i give a cryptocurrency to a panwala bhaiya and tell him uh, hey give me a bottle of coke and uh, pay me back in rupees after taking yeah. my crypto yeah right that that would be the key test for cryptos yeah. exactly and secondly i don't want do you do you want the rupee in your pocket to be worth 70 dollars when you go to sleep and wake up and see it is worth 60 dollars in the morning say 6 hours later this kind of volatility is not a uh, 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 call sign of a to be currency an alternate currency you you can't be a millionaire when you go to sleep and wake up a pauper next day morning holding only this currency yeah. so a lot of assets have got diversified or or kind of uh, uh, salted away into uh, these uh, cryptocurrencies because they have been giving money like i told you the thing to do in the equity market is buy in the morning and sell in the afternoon it's become a standard operating procedure yeah. so people have started believing that crypto should only be bought and not shorted and it's given them money and the most important part i think is which is not being uh, 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 talked about very openly for obvious reasons is the issue of black money the smartest money in the world is black money a because it is hidden b there is a big fear of a loss and c it finds safe avenue where there might be some erosion but there will be less detection so you should not get caught now so far black money was going into works of art so if you monitor art auctions worldwide and if you see a huge amount of flurry of inflows into art etc you know that financial markets are going to go down because black money does not want financial assets it's seeking alternate investments now cryptos at least in the western markets offer you anonymity there is no physical evidence in your wallet of a receipt or a stamped thappa uh, laga hua kagaz which tells you that you're holding five bitcoin it's all a computer entry somewhere yeah. Yeah. you just memorize the password to your account and that's it so this anonymity is what uh, is also another uh, 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 reason why uh, off the books money is finding its way into crypto the kind of decline you saw after janet yellen issued a statement if two or three such declines occur you'll see the weaker hands all getting uh, thrown out of crypto i'm not saying that cryptos will uh, 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 die i'm not saying that at all for crypto fans out there but what i'm saying is that you're seeing gold which is relatively far more stable it stood the test of time it's the currencies of the it is called the currency of kings and gods 
it stood the test of time for somewhat like 5000 years so where are you better holding gold or cryptos so i think hyperinflation or inflation money coming out of riskier assets into a, a safer relatively safe heaven of gold it's bound to happen it's it's a question of time so i'm super bullish on gold and super 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 bullish on silver Yes, you had mentioned last time itself that you are even more bullish on silver than on gold. So, uh, what were your targets again, Vijay? You said sixty thousand for gold and seventy-five thousand for silver. Yes, I would like to modify these targets now because these targets, mind you, Sarit, were uh, till thirty-first December two thousand twenty-one. Twenty-one, yeah. Yes. So uh, we are barely two months into the year. Uh, I would, I would, uh, if you permit me. Uh, drag the period even forward and revise the targets even higher most certainly think, please go ahead yeah i think uh, by year 22 i would be surprised if i did not see silver at 84000 and i would be surprised if i didn't see gold between 62 to 65000 i'm talking of 31st december 2022 22 uh, that is a long way up <laughs> i mean 84 I mean, uh, silver may be only twenty percent, but sixty-five for gold is quite a long way up. I mean, what what is gold right now? Um, it's it's uh, uh, close to forty-seven thousand, lower than forty-seven thousand. Sixty-two to sixty-five. That's that's truly a long way up. Yeah. And this you are expecting within twenty-two months, I think. That's right. Which tells you that fiat currency is going to lose a lot of its buying power. It certainly looks that way, and the, the new U.S. administration seems to be hell bent on printing even more money than the previous one. So, yeah, I mean, it could happen. We never know. Uh, just like how hyperinflations have happened, if anyone has studied history, they will tell you that no one expects the hyperinflation. It's always a political thing, as in. the market by itself cannot create hyperinflation because you know the countervailing forces will always come in and push prices lower as in uh, markets always have their own internal checks and balances but if politicians really want something they will eventually get it and in the western world they want high inflation so eventually they will get it no doubt about that so it's definitely Absolutely. something yeah it's definitely something that you know we need to watch out for and if the us inflation were to rise india definitely can't be left behind inflation will go up here as well it's a scary thought because no one wants to see a rise in inflation especially after the economy has taken such a big hit after covid but you never know we need to be mentally prepared for that challenge uh so that it does cover quite a lot of points vijay i mean uh, Are you seeing any uh, new trends in the markets? So, as in something that uh, could act as a silver lining, let's say. As in, in if some you know the worst case scenario were to happen, uh, can investors should should they run only into gold, or uh, are there any uh, counter bets that they can play? Contra bets? Could they buy into certain sectors, or you know, which could recover faster in the next uh, up move? Sarit, uh, uh, this is something uh, offbeat, somewhat offbeat, and uh, a lot of people. Uh, you know, <laughs> the funniest thing was I was I, in in one of the recent videos I made about how to make money all day long. Yes, yes, I remember. Morning, uh, one guy commented, "You know, your video was so boring. I almost fell off uh, asleep. <laughs> I fell, I fell asleep four times." I mean, <laughs> thank you very much. So I'm going to bore you with uh, uh, one more investment like that. Right. Okay, go ahead. It's going to it's it's going to uh, uh, appear boring, but it's backed uh, by a huge amount of study that I have put into it. I've realized uh, this is valid not just in India. In India, it is even more valid, but this is a global phenomenon. If you were to invest in indices, and you can in India also take physical delivery of indices by way of ETFs. ETFs, yeah. exchange traded funds yes. these are like mutual funds and uh, uh, the delivery of the index is given to you in electronic format it lies in your dmat account in in 
about a decade and a half ago, you had only benchmark uh, ETFs, Nifty and Bank Nifty Bs, but now you have more than half a dozen companies offering you these ETF products. Now, the beauty of the index ETFs, Sarit, is that uh, uh, if you go to the NSE's website and uh, on the first of every month, compute what constitutes the index in what weightage. We, have, we follow what we call the free float system of index computation. So it is the number of free float shares multiplied by market price, which is market capitalization, yes. right? So when a stock is rising, it's, it's, it's uh, a weightage in the index actually goes up. And when the stock is falling, the weightage of uh, that particular stock falls in the index. And if the stock becomes a laggard, you can always boot it out of the index and bring in another stock to it. Yeah. Right? Which is why indices don't fall as much as individual stocks do. You think it is safety in numbers because the Nifty is made up of 50 stocks. The Bank Nifty is comprised of 12 stocks. The BSC Sensex is comprising 30 stocks. It not, it's not just numbers, it's not just safety in numbers, but it's the way these indices are constituted. A falling or a lagging uh, a constituent automatically loses its weightage and a rising one automatically increases its weightage. You can actually go to the NSE's website and uh, click on products and indices and download these PDF files. You can get records up to 2010, if not earlier. And they are updated on the first of every month. So the data on uh, the index uh, uh, computation and the weightages of the constituents is available on the NSE's website uh, up to 2010, if not earlier, updated on a month-on-month -month basis. So the way the indices are computed, uh, if you want an investment, even though it might appear boring to you, but it's going to make you rich. If you want an investment that A, falls last or late falls less and in the case of a market reversal upwards which springs up like a jack-in-the-box i think index etfs are a good way to go for as a matter of fact we've started beta testing uh, index etfs in our in-house statistical model which we fondly call the barracuda I'm going to be putting uh, uh, some years of data into this and uh, uh, we ourselves as a company are going to start investing in index ETFs. So this is another area where I might take delivery uh, and, and delivery as you know me is something that I'm extremely uh, cagey about. Yeah. I'm a trader at heart. Yeah, micro trend trader. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a micro trend trader. I don't take delivery, but from what I've seen, I think uh, the proposition seems mouth watering. That's very interesting. Index ETFs for the long term. Mm, okay. Uh, that is something definitely our uh, viewers should consider. But uh, is there something else that you're working on, Vijay? I mean, you mentioned your statistical models. Uh, uh, could you like tell us uh, if there's uh, anything new in the works that uh, you're dealing with right now? Yes, I, I'm thinking of uh, developing uh, a product wherein um, uh, I would make uh, some pretty rapid fire recommendations. These uh, are extremely short term, like your... Uh, Micro extremely trends. short term, oh, extremely okay. short term, okay, okay. extremely short term. So uh, we are basically beta testing how. Now, uh, you see, if I was to trade or if you were to trade uh, on your computer, you have the kill switch on your keyboard. If the trade is not going uh, the way you want it to go, you can kill it immediately. Yes. But if you were to recommend the same trade to somebody, a friend maybe. So you're typing in a message on WhatsApp or Telegram or even an SMS or whatever. There is a slight amount of time lag. Yes. In which true. case the, the price would have passed you by. So in case we can get those kind of trades where uh, the time frame is slightly higher, but you're completely relaxed by the end of the day wherein you have zero positions left. You've squared up everything, no okay. matter what the outcome, profit or loss. Now, in uh, a professional trader's parlance, it is called flatlining the order book. You know, just like your ECG is flatlined when the patient is dead, yeah. your order book is supposed to be dead at the end of the day. You do not go to bed with an open trade. 
Okay. So no overnight trades, basically. Yeah, we would ideally, ideally, not have overnight trades unless we are convinced that tomorrow will bring better prices. But majority of the trades will be closed on the day. Okay. So I'm trying to see uh, if we were to take some amount of time lag between uh, uh, communicating the idea to somebody outside my office and getting away with it and make money with a reasonable degree of success. Remember the Jensen's measure I talked to you about? Yes, yes. So statistically speaking, if you take that one unit of risk, if it's giving you two units of reward and communicate it to an outsider in spite of the time lag taken between referring that rec recommendation and squaring it up because we want to be there for you at the entry and the exit, then I think uh, uh, it's going to be a very exciting time. Ahead. It sounds definitely exciting, Vijay, but it also sounds like a big challenge for you. As in how, how is this uh, backtesting going on? As in, for how long have you been uh, testing this thing? Uh, Sarit, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the statistical model goes uh, way back. We started toying with the idea in 2007, but very frankly, I slacked off. There were a lot of things to do. As you know, I wrote two books. Yes, you uh, do. Uh, one with Equity Master, and, and both of them, with the grace of God, have been uh, 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 confirmed uh, bestsellers. I trained a lot of people at uh, various uh, institutions, mutual funds, brokerages, stock and commodity exchanges, India and abroad. So uh, this took a slight backseat. Okay. But from 2017 onwards, I've been burning the candle uh, uh, on both uh, at both ends. And uh, this work has accelerated. I've uh, uh, submitted some amount of uh, 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 trade uh, records. I'm not talking of back tests. Back tests are theory. Yes, that's true. I'm talking about real world trades where I have actually traded with my own money and submitted the records to compliance and shown them that this can be done. That is definitely exciting. As in, uh, is there uh, some details you would like to share? I know you would probably not like to share more details, but. Uh, is uh, how's the track record looking about? I mean, what's like the approx win loss ratio or something like that? Um, Sarit, uh, so far we've seen uh, uh, um, a minimum of uh, seven and a half trades out of 10 uh, going right. Wow, 75% uh, success rate. Yes, 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 yes. It's all there uh, uh, with uh, the compliance department at Equity Master. These are real world trades. They are screenshot of uh, my terminal. They are uh, uh, end of the day uh, trade books, order books, all submitted there. And uh, uh, so far it's good. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in the finance market, it is said that uh, a trader is in the business of, not in the business of believing people, but disbelieving people. If the price is telling you something, if it is too easy a trade, you're supposed to doubt. So it, it becomes very difficult for me to, to bet on somebody, right? But if I was to bet on this model, which is uh, something uh, I've created, and I keep asking myself, am I partial to this model because it's my baby? Or am I, am I gung-ho about this model because it actually stands the test of the time and trades in the market? I think... I'm fairly unbiased and agnostic in saying that I would bet on the system. That's great to hear, Vijay. It's great to hear. I'll definitely, I mean, I'm personally looking forward to when you'll actually re reveal the final end product once all the testing is done. Uh, I'm, of course, not privy to the trades that you're doing, but of course, 75% uh, success rate certainly looks or sounds very exciting to me. Of course, here I would like to add a caveat that Vijay is not promising a 75% success rate in any kind of trading system uh, that he may or may not come up with in the future. But the way he's, uh, his uh, personal uh, system, as he has just described, is working out, it certainly sounds very exciting. So, Vijay will definitely look forward to that. Uh, yes, Arit, I, I would put in a caveat here. Like I said, these are trades where the kill switch is with me. Yeah, it's with you. That's now, right. when you when you actually make a, ref, a recommendation to somebody, the time lag between uh, uh, putting in a trade and uh, telling 
somebody to modify the rate or get out close the trade yeah. these can have these can have uh, an impact on the trade itself Absolutely. but i don't expect i don't expect uh, uh, hopefully uh, the trade to go any lower than uh, uh, a six and a half seven uh, good trades out of 10 that sounds good to me at least so i'll definitely look forward to that and i believe we have a run out of time so i would like to once again thank you vijay for joining us i believe this is the fifth time you have been on the investor up yes uh, the pleasure and privilege has been mine yeah. uh, we had a uh, Uh, Bridges, who was on the Investor last week, and he had uh, fondly noted that the title is Investor Hour and not Trader Hour. So <laughs> I reminded him that the person who has been on the Investor the most is you, <laughs> who is a trader. So <laughs> it's great to have have you once again, and I hope you will join us once again and share even more insights with us. I'm I'm always very happy to join uh, uh, you and Rahul uh, uh, in the investor. I look I look forward to our next uh, uh, investor hour meeting. Uh, sure. Thank you for having me. Th- thanks a lot, Vijay, and all, to all all our viewers. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, we'll be back again next time with another guest in the investor, and hopefully they'll be able to uh, shine as much light on your investments and trading as Vijay has done for us too. Vijay, Thank thanks you. a lot. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.